Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I have gathered three horror stories for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy them. If you love stories like these, please give us a like. And if you want to support the channel, please subscribe. Thank you so much for all the support. Now, on with the stories. I've got to tell you about the time I almost lost my mind at this Halloween maze. It was supposed to be a fun night out with a few friends, but it turned into something straight out of a nightmare. So grab a drink, get comfy, and let me take you through what happened that night. It was last October, right around Halloween. My friends, Jess, Mike, and Lena, and I decided to check out this new maze that had just opened up downtown. They were advertising it as the scariest maze ever, with live actors, intricate sets, and even some high-tech scares. We thought it would be a blast, something different from our usual movie marathons and haunted house visits. We arrived just as the sun was setting, which was perfect for the whole spooky vibe. The entrance was massive, with flickering orange lights and fog machines creating this eerie atmosphere. There were tons of people already queuing up, all pumped for a good scare. We grabbed our tickets, bought some glow sticks for fun, and went in. The first section was pretty standard, dark corridors, creepy decorations, actors jumping out to scare people. Nothing too intense, and we were laughing and trying to scare each other. But then, things started to get weird. We entered a part of the maze called the Forgotten Carnival. It was supposed to look like an abandoned carnival ground, complete with broken rides and decaying booths. As we walked through, the lights dimmed and the noise level dropped. The usual sounds of laughter and carnival music were replaced with this low, droning hum that sent chills down my spine. The path twisted and turned, and suddenly we realized we weren't moving forward like the others. It was like we were stuck in some kind of loop. Jess suggested we split up to find the exit, but Mike was hesitant. Lena, always the brave one, insisted that she knew a shortcut. Reluctantly, we agreed to stay together for safety. We followed Lena deeper into the maze, the walls seeming to close in around us. The carnival theme got even creepier. There were mannequins with hollow eyes and the remnants of old games that looked more sinister than fun. Then we heard it, a faint whispering sound, like someone chanting our names. We looked around, trying to locate the source, but all we saw were shadows moving just out of sight. My heart was pounding, and I could feel sweat trickling down my back. We pressed on, hoping to find a way out but the maze seemed endless. After what felt like hours, we stumbled upon a clearing with an old carousel. It was eerily still, the horses frozen in mid-gallop. The whispers grew louder, almost like they were coming from the carousel itself. Lena reached out to touch one of the horses, but as soon as her fingers brushed the cold metal, the carousel started to spin on its own. The lights flickered, and the whispering turned into ghostly laughter. We froze, unable to move. The carousel's movement quickened, and suddenly the horses' heads began to twist and contort into grotesque shapes. Jess screamed, and we all started to back away, but the path behind us had vanished. We were trapped. Panic set in as the maze seemed to shift around us. The carnival decorations became more twisted, tickets flying through the air like blood, banners that bled red paint, and the air grew thick with an oppressive darkness. We tried to find another way out, but every turn led us deeper into the nightmare. Mike, usually so steady, started to hyperventilate. Lena tried to calm him down, but the fear was contagious. Then, out of nowhere, a figure appeared in front of us. It was tall and gaunt, with hollow eyes that seemed to pierce right through us. It raised a bony hand and pointed down the path, motioning for us to follow. Without thinking, we started moving in the direction the figure pointed. The ground beneath our feet felt unstable, like we were walking on shifting sand. The whispers followed us, growing louder and more frantic. The figure led us to an old funhouse section of the maze, where mirrors distorted our reflections into monstrous versions of ourselves. In the center of the funhouse was a mirror so large it took up an entire wall. The figure gestured for us to look into it. Reluctantly, we did. What we saw wasn't our reflection, but a vision of ourselves trapped, screaming, and desperate to escape. It was like a warning, a glimpse into a possible future if we didn't find a way out soon. Terrified, we turned away, but the maze was relentless. The paths kept looping back, and the scenery changed in impossible ways. 
walls bending, floors tilting, and the very fabric of reality seeming to unravel. We could hear footsteps behind us, but when we turned, no one was there. It felt like we were being hunted by something unseen. Just when we thought we couldn't take it anymore, we heard voices, our friends outside the maze calling our names, trying to find us. It was like a beacon of hope in the darkness. We ran towards the sound, the maze responding by becoming even more chaotic, with obstacles and barriers appearing out of nowhere. But we pushed through, fueled by the desperate need to escape. Finally, we burst through the exit, gasping for air, covered in sweat and trembling. The bright lights of the outside world were almost blinding after the darkness we'd endured. We looked around, but the maze had closed behind us, as if it never existed. Our friends rushed over, hugging us and asking what happened. We couldn't fully explain it, how the maze had changed, how it felt alive, like it was feeding off our fear. We decided to leave it behind, never to return. But even now, months later, I sometimes wake up in a cold sweat, hearing the whispers and feeling the oppressive darkness of that forgotten carnival. It was supposed to be a fun night out, but instead it became a terrifying ordeal that I still can't shake. So yeah, that's my story. If you ever hear about a new maze opening up, maybe think twice before going in. Some places aren't just about scares and thrills. They might be hiding something much darker. You know, I've always loved Halloween. The costumes, the candy, the spooky decorations. It's a blast. But last year, something happened at this new Halloween maze in town that I can't shake off. It was supposed to be just another fun night with friends, but it turned into one of the scariest experiences of my life. So there's this place called Shadows Hollow Maze that opened up downtown. It's supposed to be super immersive, with all sorts of creepy sets and actors dressed up to spook you. My friend Jake convinced me to go with him, and a couple of others, Emily and Ryan. I wasn't too keen at first, but Jake was pretty persuasive, saying it'd be a great adventure. We arrived just as the sun was setting. The maze entrance was this old, creaky gate covered in fake ivy and dimly lit by flickering lanterns. The air was cool, and there was this eerie fog that seemed to roll in from nowhere. As we stepped inside, the gate slammed shut behind us, and the sounds of distant whispers echoed through the trees. The first part of the maze was standard stuff. Twisted paths, spooky sounds, actors popping out from the shadows. We laughed it off, making fun of the cheap props and predictable scares. But after about half an hour, things started to get weird. The paths began to change more than usual, leading us in circles or to dead ends that didn't seem to have been part of the original layout. Emily was getting anxious, which was odd because she usually loves scary stuff. Guys, this doesn't feel right, she said, her voice shaking. Ryan was trying to lighten the mood, cracking jokes, but even he looked uneasy. Jake, on the other hand, was pushing us forward, saying it was all part of the experience. We turned a corner and entered a section called the Forgotten Garden. It was supposed to be a creepy greenhouse filled with poisonous plants and ghostly apparitions. But instead, it was this overgrown area with tangled vines that seemed to move on their own and plants that looked almost sentient. The air was thick and it felt like something was watching us. Suddenly, the path split into two directions. Jake insisted we take the left path, saying it was the main route. But something about it felt off. As we walked, the lighting got dimmer, and the sounds turned more distorted, like whispers just beyond understanding. Then without warning, the ground beneath us seemed to shift. The path turned into a narrow tunnel and the walls started closing in, squeezing us tighter. Panic set in. We tried to backtrack, but the tunnel seemed endless. That's when we heard it a low, guttural growl coming from deep within the walls. Ryan grabbed my arm, eyes wide. We need to find another way out, he whispered. We stumbled into a large, cavernous room lit by flickering sconces. In the center stood a massive, ancient-looking tree with gnarled branches that stretched up to the ceiling. Hanging from its limbs were dozens of lanterns, each containing a small, flickering flame. But what was even more unsettling were the shadows that danced around the room, moving independently of any light source. Jake was trying to lead us forward again, but Emily was frozen, staring at the tree. Look, 
she pointed. Beneath the tree, there were dozens of tiny figures. Children, I think, sitting in a circle, their faces pale and eyes hollow. They weren't moving, just staring blankly ahead. My stomach churned. It looked like some kind of ritual, but without any sound or motion. As we watched, one of the figures slowly turned its head to face us. Its eyes seemed to follow us, and it let out a soft, echoing wail. Suddenly, the lanterns flickered violently, and the shadows in the room began to twist and contort into grotesque shapes. It felt like the air was getting thicker, making it harder to breathe. Jake tried to push forward again, but something snapped. The ground beneath him gave way, and he fell into darkness with a loud thud. We rushed to his side, calling his name, but there was no response. Just silence, and the distant sound of that eerie wail. Emily and Ryan were freaking out now. We have to find him, Emily cried, tears streaming down her face. But I didn't know where to start. The maze seemed to have no logic anymore, twisting and turning in impossible ways. The walls were closing in again, and the whispers were getting louder, almost like voices chanting in an ancient language. We wandered aimlessly for what felt like hours, every step taking us deeper into the maze's nightmare. The fog grew thicker, and the temperature dropped, making our breaths visible in the dim light. At one point, I thought I saw Jake's shadow moving on its own across the wall, but when I turned to look, he wasn't there. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we stumbled into a clearing. In the center was an old, decrepit carousel, its paint peeling and the horses frozen in twisted poses. The carousel began to turn on its own, creaking and groaning as if powered by some malevolent force. The lights flickered, casting long, sinister shadows across the ground. Emily collapsed against a horse, sobbing. Ryan was trying to steady her, but he was shaking too. I scanned the area, desperate to find Jake, but he was nowhere to be seen. Then, I heard a faint cry, a muffled sound coming from behind the carousel. I rushed over, heart pounding, and found Jake lying on the ground, unconscious but alive. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. As I reached out to help him up, the carousel stopped abruptly. The shadows in the clearing converged, forming into a dark, humanoid figure with glowing red eyes. It let out a bone-chilling laugh that echoed around us, and the ground beneath our feet began to tremble. The figure raised its arms, and the lanterns above us went out, plunging us into darkness. We ran without looking back, the sound of the entity's laughter chasing us through the maze. Every turn felt like we were running in circles, and the oppressive darkness made it impossible to find our way. Emily was screaming, Ryan was barely keeping up, and Jake was dragging himself forward, his face pale and eyes wide with terror. Just when I thought we couldn't run any further, the entrance to the maze came into view. We sprinted towards the light, not stopping until we burst out of the gate and into the cool night air. We collapsed on the ground, gasping for breath, hearts pounding in our chests. Looking back, the maze stood silent and still, as if nothing had happened. But we all knew what we'd been through was real. Jake was still unconscious, and it took a while for him to come to. When he did, he could barely remember anything beyond the entity in the darkness. Since that night, none of us have gone back to Shadow's Hollow Maze. It was closed shortly after, with no explanation from the organizers. Sometimes when I think about it, I can still hear that eerie laughter in my mind, and the feeling of those shadows closing in. Halloween used to be my favorite time of year, but now, it's a reminder of that terrifying night when a fun adventure turned into a nightmare I can't escape. You know how some Halloween mazes are just your standard cornfield with a few predictable jump scares? Well, let me tell you about the time my friends and I decided to brave this place called The Ripper. It was supposed to be the highlight of our Halloween season, but trust me, it turned into something straight out of a nightmare. It was a chilly October evening, around 7 p.m. My friend Gerald had heard about The Ripper from some local Facebook group, and he was super excited about it. He said it was different from other mazes more immersive with actors and elaborate sets. Naturally, a bunch of us were intrigued, so we decided to give it a shot. The group consisted of me, Gerald, Mia, Sarah, and Tom. We thought it would be a fun way to spend the night, get some scares, and maybe even win a prize if we made it through without losing anyone. When we arrived, the entrance looked pretty standard, 
a wooden archway draped with fake cobwebs and eerie lights flickering in the windows. The sign read, Welcome to the Ripper, enter if you dare. There was a long line of people already waiting, but we weren't too worried. After all, what's a little crowd on Halloween night? As we walked through the entrance, the temperature seemed to drop. The lights inside were dim, and there was this constant hum of creepy sounds, whispers, distant screams, and the occasional animal noises. The maze was divided into different sections, each with its own theme. We got a map from one of the staff members, who looked kind of creepy herself with pale makeup and dark circles under her eyes. She just nodded and handed us the map, before disappearing into the shadows. We started our journey through the maze, laughing and joking to keep the tension light. The first section was a haunted forest, complete with twisted trees and fog rolling along the ground. We navigated through it without much trouble, but things started to get weird as we moved deeper into the Ripper. The next area was an abandoned asylum. The walls were covered in faux peeling paint, and there were old medical equipment props scattered around. Suddenly, Mia screamed. We turned to see her pointing at a figure in a straitjacket standing in the corner, its face obscured by shadows. Before we could react, the figure lunged at her, and we all scattered, our hearts pounding. We regrouped quickly, but the incident left a lingering unease. Probably just an actor, Gerald said, trying to reassure us. But the atmosphere had shifted. The maze seemed darker, the sounds louder, and the paths more convoluted. We decided to stick together, but soon, things started to unravel. As we moved into the next section, it felt like the maze was playing tricks on us. The walls seemed to shift, and pathways we thought we had taken before led us back to the same spot. Our phones had no reception, and the map we had was starting to look unreliable. It was like the maze was alive, intentionally disorienting us. Then came the part called the Forgotten Carnival. The entrance was marked by a broken down Ferris wheel and rusted carnival games. The area was eerily quiet, except for the faint sound of carnival music playing somewhere in the distance. We walked cautiously, and that's when Sarah noticed something strange, a clown puppet hanging from a tree, its smile too wide and eyes too empty. Guys, look at this, she whispered. We all stared, feeling a chill run down our spines. Suddenly, the puppet started to move, its head swiveling to follow us as we passed by. We quickened our pace, but it felt like the entire carnival section was closing in on us, the shadows lengthening and the air growing colder. We reached what was supposed to be the exit for the carnival section, but instead of finding a way out, we stumbled into a narrow corridor lined with mirrors. The reflections were distorted, showing us twisted versions of ourselves. It was disorienting, and each step we took seemed to echo louder than the last. Mia tripped over something, and when we looked down, we saw a trail of what looked like blood leading deeper into the maze. What the hell is that? Tom asked, his voice shaking. Before anyone could answer, the lights flickered and went out completely. We were plunged into darkness, the only sound our ragged breathing and the pounding of our hearts. Panic set in as we tried to find each other, but it was like the maze swallowed us whole. We heard whispers all around, indistinguishable words floating through the air. Suddenly, Gerald screamed. We scrambled towards the sound, and there he was, standing by what looked like a shallow grave dug into the ground. His face was pale, eyes wide with fear. We need to get out of here, he said urgently. But as we turned to leave, the ground beneath us seemed to shift, and we found ourselves sinking slowly into darkness. We managed to pull ourselves out just in time, gasping for air. The maze had thrown us another curveball, and we were no closer to escaping. Our flashlight batteries were dying, and the only light came from the flickering overhead bulbs that provided more shadows than illumination. At one point, Mia disappeared. We called her name frantically, but there was no response. We split up to search, despite our fear, thinking she might have found a way out. I wandered into a room that looked like a decrepit library, books scattered everywhere. As I tried to find my friends, the door slammed shut behind me, and the room seemed to close in. I could hear muffled cries and footsteps, but every time I turned to look, there was nothing there. Meanwhile, back with the group, Gerald, Sarah, and Tom were desperately trying to retrace their steps. The maze felt endless, every turn leading to more confusion and terror. They stumbled upon a room filled with old televisions, all playing static and random images. 
One screen flickered to life, showing a distorted version of our group, as if taunting us. You'll never leave, the image whispered before cutting back to static. We finally regrouped near what we thought was the exit, but instead of finding a way out, we encountered the maze's final section, the Dark Ritual. This area was designed like an ancient temple, with stone pillars and eerie symbols carved into the walls. In the center stood a large, ominous altar, surrounded by hooded figures chanting in a language none of us understood. As we approached, the chanting stopped, and all eyes turned to us. The lead figure stepped forward, revealing a grotesque mask with hollow eyes and a wide, sinister grin. You should not have come, it intoned, and the ground began to tremble. Suddenly, the maze seemed to come alive. Walls closed in, the floor cracked open, and shadows reached out to grab us. We ran with everything we had, pushing through debris and dodging falling objects. It felt like we were running against time itself, every second stretching into eternity. Just when we thought we couldn't go any further, we burst through the final gate of the maze. The cool night air hit us, and we looked back to see the entrance closed, the lights flickering one last time before everything went dark. We were safe, but the relief was short-lived. Mia was nowhere to be seen, and no matter how much we searched, she was gone. We reported her missing the next day, but the Ripper had already shut down, disappearing as mysteriously as it had appeared. The police found no trace of her, and the other visitors had similar stories of feeling lost and hunted within the maze. It was like the Ripper didn't want anyone to leave, trapping their fears inside forever. Months have passed since that terrifying night, but the memory still haunts me. I often think about Mia and wonder what happened to her in that maze. Sometimes, when the wind is just right, I can hear faint whispers calling my name, reminding me that the Ripper is still out there, waiting for its next victims. So, this Halloween, if you hear about a new maze popping up, think twice before you enter. Some places aren't just about scares and fun, they can be gateways to something far more sinister. Trust me, I learned that the hard way, and I wouldn't wish that nightmare on anyone. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Thank you for listening.